Victor and welcome. Oh, <laughs> welcome. Oh, that sounds a whole lot better. A very warm welcome to each and every one of you and a warm welcome to those that are watching online all throughout the United States and Europe and Asia. It's good to have you as always. Just to remind you, we are going into the Christmas season and the offices of the church will be operating from 8 to 1 every day. In fact, from Tuesday to Friday, 8 to 1 and uh, our staff have, uh, well, a selection of our staff have taken uh, leave. So if there is any need for us to serve, to help, if you need counseling, uh, any pastoral intervention, then family, we would encourage you to uh, contact the office from 8 till 1, and it will only be a great pleasure for us to help wherever we can. I wonder if you would stand up this morning as we commit this time to the Lord. God has given me a word for you, and I do believe that this word will challenge you. In fact, every one of us really needs to sit and receive this. I don't think there's any mortal that will not be challenged by what God is about to say to us. But I'm expectant for a great fruit and a great harvest to come into your life as a result of what God is about to say to you. How many of you love hearing from the Lord? Can I see your hand? You just love hearing from the Lord. That's wonderful. Let's pray together. Father, we come together in the wonderful name of Jesus. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are your sheep. And we, your sheep, we know and discern your voice. You are a God who speaks and who speaks in abundance. And you take care and love and direct each and every one of us by that voice. I ask God today that as we come to your word, that your word would find its place in the very depths of our heart. I ask God that we would embrace your word, that we would welcome your word, that no matter the challenge, no matter the situation, the circumstance, that we would push all that aside, push beyond that, and our hearts would be open to receive. And by faith, we see ourselves sitting, as it were, at the feet of Jesus, as, as we know that this is his word, that is about to be ministered. And we say, speak, Lord, because we, your servants, are listening. And I thank you, God, that every single one of us would recognize your voice. And Lord, you speak to many different situations as we would hear your word. And what would be received by one person might be different from another because we've got different situations that we are traversing in our lives. Your voice is truly over many waters. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to receive. We thank you, God, that we have ears to hear, eyes to see, that we would perceive and that we would have the courage and the faith to do what it is that you are saying for us to do. And so we love you with every fiber of our being. And I thank you, God, that this word is for us. We don't look at the person on either side or, or write the names of anybody else, but we are allowing you by the very person of your spirit to inscribe these words of life and healing, these words of grace on the very tablets of our heart. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, God, that we are strengthened and that we are equipped in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says, Amen. You may be seated, family. It's good for us to be together. And we just are so looking forward to a wonderful time with our families over the Christmas season. If you have your Bibles with you, I wonder if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read from the Amplified Classic. And it says, She, Mary, gave birth to her son, her firstborn, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room or place for them in the inn. 
Many times when we watch what happens in the lives of other people, when we read the stories of what happens in the Bible, we look at those stories and we make sense of it at face value. We look at the story of Jesus, how he was born in this remarkable way, and we say, well, Christmas must surely be about the story of how God, who is invisible, took on flesh, and there was no room at, at, at the city, and so they found this place as stable, and there they were, Jesus was placed in the manger. And we think, well, that's the Christmas story. But actually, there is more to the Christmas story than the birth of the Messiah. It is about the birth of the Messiah. But there is more to the story, family, than the birth of the Messiah. The Bible describes the arrival of Jesus as the appearance of the goodness and loving kindness of God. There was the birth of a Messiah, but there was the appearance of the goodness and the loving kindness of God. That means that when Jesus appeared on the earth, goodness appeared. The birth of Jesus is the single most significant act of goodness that the world has ever seen. If you want to find out what is the best act of goodness that we have ever seen in the history of humanity, you, you might go and have a look at certain people's lives, Mother Teresa and others, but I can tell you that the greatest act of goodness that you will ever find is when Jesus came to the earth. The arrival of Jesus was the appearance of goodness and the loving kindness of God. And there will never be a kinder and more beneficial act ever again seen in the world than the birth of Jesus at the manger. In other words, there is something that God was doing behind the scenes that if you would look at that story and you see the story at its surface, it's wonderful, but there was something else that God was doing for you today in that story many, many years ago. Look at what the Bible says in Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Notice the Bible says that the goodness of God appeared, that the loving kindness of God appeared. All of this happened on Christmas Day. In other words, the mission of Jesus when he came here on the earth was a mission not only to be victorious, not only to conquer, but his mission was one of goodness. Would you tell the person next to you, when Jesus came to the earth, his mission was one of goodness. I wonder if you could find somebody else, those that are watching online, find somebody else. And would you say, when Jesus appeared, goodness appeared. Now, the Bible has much to say about what happened in this mission. We know that Jesus came to destroy and to loosen the works of the devil. We know that Jesus came to make a public spectacle of the devil, to, to rob him of his power, to defeat him. We know that that's what Jesus came to do. But the question that I'd like to ask is, how did God overcome evil in us? The wrongdoing that we do. You know, the Bible says that Habakkuk, in, in Habakkuk, that God he is a God who has eyes that are too pure to look on evil and who cannot tolerate wrongdoing. How does a God who is such, who is so holy, so righteous, how does he overcome evil in us without himself becoming overcome with evil? You know, if we have a look at the way that we deal with ourselves, if somebody does you wrong, Outside of Christ, I must put that, this is BC. If somebody does you wrong, then generally what happens is we've got to equal that wrong and take one step up. It's called one-upmanship. 
The whole idea is if you're not one up, then you're one down, and no one wants to be one down. So if I do you wrong, you're going to do equal wrong plus a little bit more. And then when you do a little bit more and you do that to me and then I get upset, what am I going to do? I'm going to do that same amount of wrong back to you and a little bit more until eventually we barely surviving in this thing. I go and slash your tires. Then what are you going to do? You come and find my car in the middle of the night. You in your stealth mode like the grouch. You come and you slash my one tire and you slash my other tire. You got to be one up on me. How many of you know what I'm saying here? You're looking at me with this very reverent look. I'm getting worried. Am I living on the same planet? That's what we do, family is we want to be one up on each other. We've got to have that last and final word in that argument when, when the fur is flying all over the place. Oh, I've got to have that final word. Where even if it's a whisper, I've just got to get that final word. In other words, we try to deal with evil and wrongdoing by doing wrong and evil back in return. We fall into the evil trap that just gets us both in this place of defeat. How does God deal with the evil in us? And the Bible gives us insight as to how he does this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 21. The Bible says, do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but notice what it says, overcome Master evil with good. That's God's way. We try and overcome evil with evil. You're nasty to me, I'm going to be nasty back. You say those things about me, I'm going to say them back. You post that on Facebook, I'm going to post it on Facebook, and I'm going to tweet, and I'm going on the gram, and I'm going to find, I'll make a new social media platform if I have to, but I'm going to get one up. But God overcomes evil, not by giving in to evil, but he, count, he overcomes evil with good. So God got the best of evil without compromising his own holy, unstained nature when he came into an evil world and he overcame evil with good. So family, when we look at the Christmas pageant and we look at that, that manger, the cry of the baby in the stable was God winning a victory over wrong things, over wrong things by the good things that he was doing in that moment. It was a mission of goodness. God was not defeated by evil, by doing evil in return to evil. No, God did good in the midst of evil. And family, the Bible tells us that God is a good God. I thought I'd get one amen at least. Would you tell the person next to you, my God is a good God. He's a good God. He's, he's, not, he's not an ugly God. He's not an angry God. He's a good God. Goodness is his very core. Moses cried out to the Lord and he said, Lord, would you show me your glory? Now, I mean, if, if I didn't know what happened, I would have thought, well, God would come down and there would be a big light and he's got to fall on the floor and put sunglasses on. Maybe that's when sunglasses were invented, when Moses encountered the glory of the Lord because it, it was like this unapproachable light. But that's not what happened. The, the Lord begins to proclaim to Moses who he is. And this is what he says, Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. No one is good except God alone. That's what Jesus said. If you want to know what goodness is, then you look to Jesus and the goodness of God family shines its brightest on Christmas day. The appearance of Jesus was the appearance of goodness. So when Jesus was born on that day, 
A goodness never so seen was demonstrated to the world. It was a loving goodness. It was a salvation goodness. And I want the best of you for you goodness. A goodness that never changes. A, a, a goodness that is given to us even when we go our own way. A goodness that is undeserved, undeniable. A goodness that chases us down for the good. God's goodness is so out of the ordinary, a goodness never so seen that the moment we encounter it, you and I are forever changed. It's a transforming goodness. When Jesus came to the earth, goodness came. And when goodness came, transformation came to those who would receive it. Look at what the Bible says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 7. Don't you know that the reason God is good to you is because He wants you to turn to Him. The way that God gets our attention is to do good to us. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And when we know that we're undeserving and we know that we've, we've made our bed and, 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 and now we're lying in it and everyone else was, would say to you, we told you not to do it. Now you lie in that bed and you're going you're gonna to deal with those consequences. You lie in it. It's your problem. God says to us, no, let me bring you to a better way. Let me bring you to a better way. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, you made your bed, you, you're going to lie on it. But that's not what God says to us. Imagine if God said that to us, we would not be here today. Imagine if God said, I told you not to do that. You went ahead and did it. And God says, you've got to make your bed and you've, you've li you're going to lie on it. We would not be here today. That's not the goodness of God. God says, there's a better way. I'm going to lead you to a better way. And when God repays us such good for our evil, do you know what that does? It transforms our worship. We can never worship God by singing mindlessly out of a hymn book if we've encountered the goodness of God because the goodness of God gets us to be sorry for what we've done and it causes us to turn and look to Jesus. It causes us to run to Jesus. And when we dig in our heels, do you know what God does? He's patient with us. And he, God waits for us to gather ourselves to ourselves. And he, He's waiting for us to take that first step back. And I know that the most difficult step is the first step. What is, what is God going to think? What is my Father going to think? My Heavenly Father. It must be the most difficult step to take. But when you take that first step, you feel the love of God. Then you take the next step and you feel the love of God and the acceptance of God and the embrace of God. Do you know what happens? What once was a few uncertain steps becomes a sprint into the hands of Jesus. And I can tell you tonight, this morning, family, that Jesus catches you every single time. Look at what the Bible says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. God is kind. Would you say with me, God is kind. But notice what it says, but He is not soft. In kindness, He takes us firmly by the hand and He leads us into a radical life change. Isn't that wonderful? In other words, you can never be the same when you encounter the goodness of God. The goodness of God means that forgiveness is possible for you. And God's forgiveness means that He is generous. He is abundant with you. If you understand how God forgives you, He is generous. He is abundant with you. And God's forgiveness is God's abundance towards you and I. Look at Numbers 7, or rather Numbers 9, 17. But you are a God who is ready to forgive. 
He's ready to forgive. He's not reluctant. You don't have to bribe him. Oh God, I'll come and I'll, I'll give you this. I'll give you that God. And then, and then maybe you might think about forgiving me. No, that's not the kind of God that you serve. He's a good God. And when you turn to him, he's waiting, he's poised. He wants to forgive you. He's gracious and he's merciful. He's slow to anger. It takes a lot to get God angry, a lot. Let me just say, he does get angry against sin, but he's not this kind of God that when you, when you uh, take a left turn instead of a right turn, God gets so angry, he sends down lightning from heaven, and then we say, oh, well, there was another one, took a wrong turn. No, that's not the kind of God that we serve. He's, lo- he's slow to anger, and he's abounding in steadfast love. You and I can say, God, you are a God who is ready to deal graciously with us. That you are a God who is ready to show me favor. Would you tell the person next to you, my God is ready to show me favor. Come on, put a bit of a preacher attitude on there. You can give them a good of a, you know, preacher swag. Say, find somebody else and say, my God is ready to show me favor. He is a God that despite the embarrassing tally of all the list of our wrongdoings, He's ready to send it all away in His goodness when we turn to Him, to set us free from that guilt and that condemnation, to make everything new for you. Oh, I've done so much wrong, God. I've lived my life without you. No, but when you turn to Him, He's gonna make everything new. The old way of living disappears. You become a brand new, person on the inside and you become fresh and new on on, on the inside of you. This is the goodness of God. And you know, family, when you experience that forgiveness, there's such joy that comes with it. Again and again throughout the Scriptures, forgiveness is linked with joy. Here's a Scripture, Psalm 32 verse 1, blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So that when God forgives us, He takes hold of that sin. And you know what He does? He lifts that sin off you. He removes it. The forgiveness of God means that our sin has been taken away. Would you say that with me? Taken away. Come on, would you say it again? Taken away. God takes up our sin and He carries it away. And the goodness of God conveys His generosity to us because you know, He is infinitely generous because He takes that sin away when we turn to Him. When Jesus appeared, goodness never so seen appeared. That when we call upon Jesus, there is an immediate response from God. And when he responds, he doesn't just like kind of half-heartedly show up and hear your plea. No, he showers you with all his riches, riches that are beyond our reach in the natural. So that in the moment of your despair, You stand there and you cry out to God and God comes and He forgives you and He's kind to you and He's generous and you leave that crying out to God so rich, you don't even know what to do with all of it. That's the God we serve. Romans chapter 10 verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all. Now notice what He does bestowing his riches, bestowing his riches, not just one rich element of him, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Not just some, not just the favored, not just the ones with the brightly colored coat, not just the ones with the best weave in town, all who call upon God. He bestows his richness. And despite who we are and where we are with God, something good can still happen in your life. 
You, you might say, well, I, I, I'm far gone, Wayne. I, I'm far gone. Something good can still happen in your life. Come on. We, we, we were dead in our trespasses before Christ. We were undeserving. We were denied applicants, so to speak. We fell short of the glory of God. But do you know what happened? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy. Would you say rich in mercy? Those are one of the riches that, that God bestows on you because of the great love with which he, had, he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Do you know what God did? Here is what happens when the goodness comes. He made us alive together with Christ. And by grace, you have been saved. And guess what God has done? He's raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow, such goodness, such forgiveness, such a heavenly response. And every one of us can be included. The goodness of God is not limited, family. It's not just good for maybe someone who can run the 100 meters in under 10 seconds and the rest of us stand not a chance. No, God is good to everyone. Would you say to the person next to you, my God is good to everyone. In other words, God has placed no limits to his generosity and to his consideration of us. The least deserving, hear me this morning, the least deserving still have a chance with God. The hardest criminal still has a chance with God. The very least of us still have a chance with God. He never, ever says, I can't do anything for you. If you have a look at the life of Paul, I don't know if, if I was God, whether I would do for Paul what God did for Paul, the goodness that God showed Paul. Have you ever considered the fact that Paul would cast believers out of cities and would supervise their stoning so that they would be killed. That he would breathe threats and murder against the disciples of Jesus. That he would get letters from the high priest and he would go out and he would look for every, every, every believer that he could find, man or woman, even children, and he would arrest them and he would bring them back to Jerusalem. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 9, verse 13, he did unimaginable evil against all the saints at Jerusalem. And he was so fervent and so zealous, he created havoc all throughout the city. He ravaged the church. He would go into houses unannounced without an arrest warrant. And he would go and drag off men and women who were believers in Jesus and they would be committed to prison. What would we do with such a man? What would Jesus do with such a man? You know what he did? He met him on the road to Damascus. And Jesus showed Saul uncommon kindness and generosity and took his life out of being a murderer and made him an apostle who wrote three quarters of the New Testament. And this man, family, testifies. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful appointing me to his service. There's his goodness. Though formerly I was a blasphemer. In other words, he's saying I didn't deserve it. A persecutor, an insolent opponent. Did that matter to God? No. Did that stop the kindness of God and the intervention of God? No. He says, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of the Lord overflowed. It wasn't just a little bit of a trickle, a little bit of a sprinkle, it overflowed. Can I hear you say that word, overflowed? And it overflows to you this morning. 
overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Let's hop along to the amplified version. He goes on to say, but I obtained mercy for the reason that in me as the foremost of sinners. In other words, I was the, the, in the front of the line when it came to sinning. Jesus Christ might show forth and display all his perfect long suffering and patience. In other words, what he was saying is when, when we in 2022 look at the life of Saul, and we see how bad he was, and when we see what good Jesus did for him, there is no one that will never be able to encounter the goodness of God. No one. Tax collectors visited by Jesus. There is no sin that is so great and so overwhelming that God can't do anything for you. There is no situation that that leaves grace powerless. There's no circumstances, no matter how bleak, no matter how dark it is, that the goodness and the kindness of God cannot bring about a change. Do you know why I say that? Because the Bible says in Romans 5.20, where sin increased, grace abounded. Where sin increased. So God does not do good to us on the grounds of of what we have done or who we are or or what other people think of us, God does good to us on the grounds of his rich mercy. And the Bible says, whoever comes to me, Jesus speaking, John 6, 37, whoever comes to me, he says, I will never cast out. There is never a story where anyone has Jesus say, no, hold on a moment, too bad, too sinful, never. And so he's able to save us to the uttermost. Look at the lady with the alabaster jar. The Bible tells us she was a lady of ill repute. She comes to Jesus and weeps over his feet and wipes his feet with her hair and she breaks this expensive alabaster jar. Do you know what Jesus said? He says, I tell you, her sins, which are many. Well, what's your response, God, to a lady of ill repute, known in the city for her ill trade? What's your response, God? And Jesus says that she's been forgiven, and so she loved much. How many of you know that the greater the forgiveness, the greater the response of love. The greater the goodness, the greater the response of love. And she had many sins forgiven, so she loved great. Do you know, family, we love God so greatly because we've been forgiven so much. We can't just sing to God because we know what we were and we know what God has done. Our prayer life changes. Our worship changes. But I think for me, the most staggering thing about Christmas with the appearance of Jesus and the appearance of goodness is that Jesus came to the earth to save people, to be good to people who were his enemies. We were all enemies of God. We were enemies of holiness. We were enemies of righteousness. You know, the Bible says in Romans 8, 7 rather, Romans 8, 7, that the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. Our desires before Jesus came and intervened in our lives. Our desires fought against God. In our nature, we were opposed to the purposes of God. And when Jesus came to the earth, goodness never so seen appeared. And Jesus showed the greatest kindness to his enemies. Now that just bewilders me. When you look at what the Bible says about us before Christ, we we didn't obey the truth. We didn't seek after God. 
We did things that were not fitting. We were given over to a debased mind. We were full of deceit, full of envy, full of evil mindedness, full of murder, full of strife. But God overcame all that evil when Jesus appeared. Because when Jesus appeared, God's goodness appeared. That anyone who would embrace that goodness would experience the power of God's transformation in their lives. And if God can be so kind, and if God can be so forgiving to His enemies, and if God can be so gracious, and if God can be so patient, if you and I are the recipients of such wealth from God, are you ready for this? then we ought to do so one to another. God's kindness in us incites in us a kindness towards others. God's forgiveness towards us causes a ready-to-forgive attitude towards each other. 70 times seven every day. I'm quick. I'm not reluctant. I'm not delayed because I've received it. I was an enemy of God. And in my enemy, behind enemy lines, Jesus in all his goodness comes to me and he does me nothing but good. His patience towards me conjures up a patience in us towards others. In other words, God determines the nature of every one of our relationships by being to us first what we must be to others. He set the temperature. He set the standard. He's the captain of perfect relationships by His goodness. He was the God who took the lead. He showed us the way. He loved us. He forgave us. He was good to us. And our response is if that's what He's done for me, I was against Him. I, I hated Him. I put my fist up to Him by the way that I lived. And if God could come and do goodness for me, then I can do goodness to everyone around me, including those who hate me. Jesus said it like this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And he didn't say you find, figure this out, find this out for yourselves. He says you love one another just as I have loved you. Wow. So what God is saying to us this morning is, is what He's done to us, we are to do unto others. God never expects us to be what He hasn't already been to us. God never expects us to be to others what He hasn't already been to us. And the Bible is, is very clear. How do you find out a disciple? A disciple is not somebody who says, I believe in Jesus and goes around and advertises it. It's not by faith, although we must have faith. It's not by the way we pray, although we should pray. It's not by the outfits that we wear, family, the cars that we drive. The answer is simple. You can tell a disciple of Jesus by the way they love other people. Love is the guaranteed way to win people. It wins all the time. If you want to influence people, if you want to lead people to Jesus, don't shove the Bible down their throat. Love them. Watch and see how quick that works. That means that the world would look to how we deal with conflict and disagreement amongst ourselves to know that we are disciples. That means that the world takes note of us 
when we are slow to lose patience with each other, ah, there's a disciple of Jesus. When we look for ways to be constructive with each other, when we're not anxious to impress each other, when we do not cherish inflated ideas of our own importance, the world notices when we have good manners, when we do not pursue selfish advantage, when we are not touchy, when we do not keep an account of each other's evil, when we do not gloat over the wickedness of, of other people. I've heard believers say, this businessman did me in and then his business went under. Praise God. That's not the way of Christ. That's not love. The world notices us when there's no limit to our endurance with each other when we trust one another, when we're not rude, crude, or indecent. This is what the Bible says, John 1 John 4, 21. And this commandment we have from Him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. And whoever does not love abides in death. 1 John 4.20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Strong words. Strong words. The only way we walk, it's simple family. The only way we walk is to walk in love. And you know, family, love is not tokenism. Love is not me giving you like a bunch of flowers and saying, I'm sorry, and then I'm still talking about you and I'm still not talking to you. Oh, but I gave you some flowers. That's tokenism. Imagine if God did that to us. You would never want God to do that to us. When God forgives you, He forgets what you've done. So if I'm bringing up what somebody did wrong to me and I'm bringing it up, bringing it up, do you know that I'm not walking in love? Because love is to forget and to have that offense removed. That offense is removed. In other words, there is such restoration in the relationship like it was with you and God that whatever was the effect of that separation is completely healed and restored. That's forgiveness. Wow. Lovers, to throw that wrong into the sea of forgetfulness, to throw that wrong behind your back like God did it, because the only way is love. I love what Paul said to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he says, in this life, we have three great lasting qualities, faith, hope, and love. He says, but the greatest of them is love. In 1 Peter 4, verse 8, above all, have fervent and unfailing love for one another. Because love covers a multitude of sins. It overlooks unkindness and unselfishly seeks the best for others. That means if someone is unkind to you, you still seek their best. And don't be unkind back. That's love. God's love in us disregards the offenses of others. God's love in and through us covers a multitude of sins. God's love in and through us wipes away the many wrongs that have been done to us. God's love in and through us makes up for many of our faults. God's love in and through us erases, erases many sins by forgiving them. I bet the most challenging, one of the most challenging scriptures in the Bible is Luke chapter 6, verse 27, and on this I close. But I say to you who hear, 
Love your enemies. Can I tell you how we've made the scripture for us? If you come to me, I'm kind back to you. Whatever you do to me, then, then that's what I'm going to be to you. you. You invite me and include me, I'll invite you and include you. But if you don't do that to me, I'm not going to do that to you. Why must I do that? That's not love. You've got to love. We have to love our enemies. And notice what it says. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. In other words, what Jesus is saying is if you love people back that love you, then we have not risen above the love that sinners have for one another. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. In other words, we're at that same level. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind, he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Loving those who love you is the lowest level of worldly love. Calling those who call you, lowest level of love. Inviting those who invite you only, the lowest level of love. But if you can do good for your enemy, you are loving people with a God kind of love. And that's the story of Christmas. We were those enemies. And God loved us. We were enemies to holiness. Because when Jesus appeared, goodness appeared. With every head bowed and every eye closed, two things that we would like to do before we say goodbye this afternoon. There's no sin that the goodness of God does not have the power to reverse. There's no sin that is unforgivable in the sense that, I know that there are these unpardonable sins, but there's, there's no sin that is greater than the power of the blood of Jesus. And every step that you and I take to God there is a ready response from heaven. God is poised. He's ready. He's waiting. Will that person respond? Will they not respond? Oh, we're hoping they will respond. We can feel the anticipation of heaven in this moment. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you say, you know what, Wayne, I've never, I've never embraced the goodness of God. I always thought that God was angry with me, that God didn't want anything to do with me, but, but I see from His Word that God loves me. The most hardened criminal can come to Jesus. The most undeserving can come to Jesus. There is no limits. You are not out of the boundaries of God's love. In fact, God's love reaches out to you right now. It embraces you. Would you welcome it? Would you open up your heart to it? You see, you don't have to try and change yourself. Let God do all that He wants to do for you. And I'd like to lead you in a simple little prayer. We don't want to take a, a note of all the wrong you've done because 
I've got to take stock of what I did before I could even look at you. I'm throwing myself on the mercy of God just as much as everyone here is this afternoon. But would you pray with me, everyone together? Would you say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God that God raised you from the dead and that you love me. You're reaching out to me in my despair, in my frustration, in my place right now. And I receive your embrace. I'm sorry for living my life without you. And I receive your forgiveness. You take all my sin and you remove it off me right now. Everything becomes new. I become new. Everything becomes new. And I receive you today in Jesus' name. There's one more time of prayer that I'd like to do, but for those of you that say, Wayne, Man, I felt God reaching out to me. I felt that goodness reaching out to me. Right where I'm at, the goodness of God has reached out to me and I feel that embrace. And I prayed that prayer for the very first time and I meant it with all my heart. I wonder if you would be so bold as to just wave your hand at me so I can see where you are this morning. Would you wave your hand at me? Just raise your hand. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? God bless you. Who else? Over here. God bless you. There's hands going up all over the place. God bless you. Who else? You prayed that prayer for the very first time. I see that hand. Man, that lady is not stopping. She's waving. It's me. It's me. It's me. Who else? Up in the balcony. God bless you. Hey, you all over the place. Would you give me the honour of just coming and shaking your hand? Church, can we give them a big round of applause? If you raised your hand, I want you to step out from where you are and come and meet us here in the front. Come now in the Name of Jesus. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Don't say, oh, no, 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 next Sunday. No, today, it's this Sunday. Come on, church. Let's keep on clapping as they come. Come on, let's welcome them. Let's celebrate them. This is the day that they are going to experience a whole new change. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, those that have lifted up their hands over here. God bless you. God bless you. And those over there that lifted up their hands. Quickly, come down. And we're gonna, we just, I just would love to greet you and just shake your hand. Yeah, they're coming, family. Come on, let's give them a big round of applause, a big God bless you. There's more that's coming. We're so excited about the good that Jesus is doing in their lives this morning. Come on, they're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. This is good. This is good. This is Jesus doing good. This is Jesus turning lives around. Oh, come on. Come on, family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Come on, let's continue clapping. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. God bless you. God bless you. Look at all these wonderful children. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, let's keep clapping, family. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Who else? Who else says, yes, that's me. I'm coming. I'm coming in the name of Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And I'll shake your hand too. God bless you. And God bless you. Wow, look at you. So smart. Who else says, I'm coming? There's some more down this way. I am amazed at all these wonderful children that are coming to Jesus. God bless you, man. You're the mom. They're still coming. Look at this. Look at this. This is the Holy Holy Spirit saying there's a better way. God bless you, man. God bless you. Who else? Who else? It's not too late. You can still come. Come on, take your belongings. Come down and meet us here in the front. Is there anybody else this morning? You say, yes, that's me. I'm coming to Jesus. Wow, isn't this amazing? I'm going to ask the elders and the lay pastors to spend a bit of time with these precious people. Would you do that? And while you're doing this, thank you, everybody. I would like to pray with you before we go. 
And you know, family, what my big concern was as I was bringing you before the Lord. And I was saying, Lord, you've been so good to us. If I can have at least one person, have an elder, a lay pastor, a life group leader, I would really appreciate that. We want to we spend time with these people that really, really matter to us and they matter to God. Wonderful. Are you coming down? Oh, you're coming to me. Wonderful. That God says that we're to love our enemies. It's a tough one. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. When there's been misunderstanding and there's been brokenness. Do you know, family, what the Lord really impressed upon me is that one of the ways that the enemy destroys families is br he brings division and misunderstanding. So that when I'm walking this way, you see a family member and you're walking this way because we don't talk. But that cannot be for a disciple of Jesus. Because the distinguishing mark is our love one for another. That means there's no one we're not talking to. There's no one who we've deleted off our Facebook. There's no one that we've deleted off our phone. Because forgiveness has been abundant. Jesus spoke about a parable where a servant of a king owed the king 10,000 talents. A talent is what you earned in one year. 10,000 years to pay back that, that debt, impossible. And the debt was graciously forgiven. And it speaks of your and my sin. How many of you know that there is just no way that we could pay back God for His generosity and His forgiveness? But that servant was owed a hundred talents. And a hundred talents is one day's work. A hundred days, that debt would have been paid. He was released of a 10,000 year debt but he didn't have it within himself to forgive a hundred days of debt. You know what happened to that man? He was bound and he was put in jail. There's bondage. There's entrapment when we don't walk in forgiveness. We had a youth camp the one year. It was up in the Berg and man, those meetings on the Thursday and the Friday, they were so heavy, so heavy. Pastor John was one of our guest speakers. He was, he was living in Cape Town at the time. And then one of the pastors came. And do you know what he did? All he did is he spoke about forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Family, heaven broke over those young people. What once was so heavy, heaven broke. The presence of God was just so tangible and real. And those young people experienced release in their lives. I know people may have done you wrong, but how much more wrong did we do to God? 10,000 talents. Your hundred Denari, debt, is easy for me to forgive because I've been forgiven of 10,000 talents. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for each and every family that is here today. For each and every person, we are disciples of Jesus. And I ask God that every single one of us would walk in forgiveness that we would release people, that we won't hold people at ransom, that there would be forgiveness that would be abundant. And just like we've learned that you are a God, that we would be ready to forgive, quick, ready to forgive. Father, whoever it is that we're not talking to, 
whoever it is that we do a U-turn to, right now, right now, we choose to release that person, those people, that company, that organization. We release them right now in the name of Jesus. No longer will it be our rehearsal of again and again attending to the disappointment and the failure. We release them in the name of Jesus. I ask God that, that every one of us would walk in love. Every one of us. We're sorry, God, if we haven't been doing that. Help us, God. Help us have the courage to go and make right. Just like you, God, made right with us. Where on that Christmas day, Jesus appeared. But when Jesus appeared, goodness appeared. I thank you, God, for families that are united. I thank you, God, for families that are strengthened. Families that are are, are walking in forgiveness with each other. I was saying to the first service that the Lord showed me that there are ancient walls that He is breaking down in families. Walls of division where the one doesn't deal with the other. The Lord shows me that there are some families here this morning, they of a different faith and they have said things about you and your stand and, and, and there's been this charge that you've taken a son away, your husband, would you release them? Would you love them? Would you embrace them? I believe that if you do that, you will see the power of God's goodness in your family. And I believe that within a couple of months, that you'll all be sitting around the dinner table laughing together. One strong family. Father, we thank you for the work of goodness, the work of grace. Help us, Lord. We don't want to have the love at the level of sinners who do good to those who do good back. But we want to be good to everybody. Everybody. In Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Those of you that are in the front, there is a gentleman by the name of John. This is the gentleman. He's going to take you. We've got a gift that we would like to give you. So we're going to give you time to go. Can we give them a big round of applause, family? Can we sing that song, Jazz? Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Can we stand and sing it together, family?